Hi, I'm Scott Kelly with the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. We're here with Daniel Davis, one of our community development specialists. Recently, Daniel visited Bangladesh where he learned all about their microfinancing programs and how they can be applied here in the United States. Daniel, what is microfinance? The modern microfinance movement began in Bangladesh in the 1970s, where the leaders of the movement looked around and they saw communities of extreme need and communities of extreme poverty. And they saw individuals who perhaps wanted to start a business, but were unable to do so because they did not possess the collateral to start a loan or the credit rating to start a loan. So what the leaders began to imagine is what would happen if they began to provide very small loans to the very poor of Bangladesh and how that could radically transform and change their lives and their households. And when they decided to move forward, what they saw was remarkable. They saw people who would step forward, accept the loans, take pride in taking responsibility for the loans, move forward and with dignity pay back the loans. This set the path for the microfinance movement and where we are today and, and where we're going as well. Microfinance as an industry has expanded beyond microloans and is now providing insurance and providing opportunities to set up savings accounts to, to the poor across, across the globe, including here in the United States. Well, since microfinance is expanding here in the United States, what is it that made it so successful in Bangladesh and what lessons can be applied here? The amazing thing to me about microfinance in Bangladesh is that it has such a high payback rate, often in the 98th or 99th percentile. When my colleagues and I sat down with leaders of the movement in Bangladesh, we asked them that exact same question and they pointed to a couple of, of reasons. The first thing that they really attributed the success of microfinance in Bangladesh to is that the microfinance institutions know the customers that they're seeking to serve. Mm -hmm. These are uh, microfinance institutions that are bringing together people on a weekly basis, meeting in groups, offering mentoring and, and business support so that the individuals not only have an understanding of the financial services that they're receiving, but they actually have an idea of how to uh, start, create, maintain, and sustain the businesses that they're trying to develop. A second key decision that's led to success of microfinance in Bangladesh is an investment in affordable interest rates for the borrowers to pay back. Dr. Muhammad Yunus, the founder of the microfinance movement in Bangladesh, pointed out in one conversation that I was a part of that we do not exist to become loan sharks, but rather we exist to really help people. And as a result, you have to have a reasonable interest rate. Um, the microfinance institutions that are most successful have created an environment where borrowers are able to pay back their loans in a reasonable time manner, in a, in a reasonable way, and it set the borrower up for prosperity into the future. And we're seeing a problem with difficult interest rates here in the United States as well. We're seeing individuals who don't fit into the traditional financial sector who are trying to decide where to go to have their capital and financial needs, needs met. And so they'll turn to an alternative financial provider, most likely a payday lender, because they feel they have no other option. And one of the criticisms of the payday lending industry right now is that the interest rates are so out of control. So they'll accept a loan from the payday lender, they'll begin paying back the loan, realize that they're in over their head, go to another payday lender, take out another loan to pay back the first loan, and it creates a downward spiral. And so this idea of having a, an interest rate that is reasonable and is acceptable for the borrower to pay back is extremely important in the microfinance products that we're seeing push forward, especially the ones that are successful right now. The third aspect that we've seen microfinance institutions in Bangladesh instill is that there's this intrinsic focus on investing in the next generation and specifically mm -hmm. upon savings accounts. And in Bangladesh, several of the organizations incorporate specific savings plans into, into their microfinance programs. When I sat down with borrowers, they explained that they had trouble making ends meet, let alone saving money before they accepted their first microfinance loan. And now they, they point to that first disbursement of the loan as, a, as really a life-changing time when their, their household began to get on track and savings have began to develop and now they're planning for the future and not just trying to meet needs day to day. When we apply microfinance in the United States, how does that work in with uh, community economic development, especially in our low-income areas? When we're looking at community development here in the States, and especially 
economic development and how microfinance plays a role in that, I like to look at how the, there's a chain reaction that takes place. I know when I traveled from village to village in Bangladesh, the story I would hear again and again was how microfinance uh, changes one person's household and then changes another person's household and then eventually leads on to, to create a transformation in so much of the community. So what you see is you see a borrower who will step forward, they'll have an idea to start a business, they'll see that they need to do something in order to improve the household economic stability um, in their family. So they'll accept a, a, a micro loan and they'll move forward, they'll begin paying back that loan, they'll start the business, the business eventually will begin to make a return on the investment. And as that happens, they begin to make some decisions that transform their households. So they may begin to send their child to school for the first time, where in Bangladesh, it's not a public right to, to have education. And so they actually have to pay for education for their child. Every borrower I met in Bangladesh who had a child, a school-aged child, had their child in school. Their, the health of the family improves. The Grameen Bank, for example, requires every borrower to make 16 decisions that, that they have to commit to in order to receive their micro loan. And these decisions range from drinking only clean water to making repairs to their households to attending to the health of the family. Well, if, if the family is healthy, if the individual is healthy, the economic possibilities for the family are going to improve. And, and neighbors notice this. They look around and they see what's going on in the household next door, so much so that they begin to wonder, what can I do? What kind of business can I start that, that may improve the, the economic stability of, of my household? And so you have households that are improving, you have communities whose economic conditions are improving. And so this chain reaction is, is critical, and that's what we're trying to capture uh, in the United States. Uh, traditional bankers, they're often leaders in their communities. How can they uh, get involved so they're part of this microfinance chain reaction? The Community Reinvestment Act was passed in 1977 by Congress to encourage commercial banks to meet the credit needs of all sectors of their community, including low to moderate income neighborhoods. The opportunity that exists for banks today is that if they were willing to invest in, in, in providing grants to microfinance institutions to help provide the capital that can be dispersed to budding entrepreneurs in the community, that is a realm that could receive positive consideration for Community Reinvestment Act credit on the bank's behalf. In addition to that, there's opportunities to partner, right? So these microfinance institutions, most of them are nonprofit. We do see some for-profit models emerging, but at this time, most of them in, in the United States are nonprofit. So they need partners who can come alongside. The banks can serve on boards. They can provide individuals who can help re review loan applications, and they can offer technical assistance. So plenty of opportunities to provide just partnerships. Moreover, there's an opportunity where a model is emerging for microfinance institutions today in, this, in the United States where they're seeking to connect individuals to banking services, to traditional financial services, where they may, the microfinance institution, may provide a, a loan disbursement at this time to help meet the need, but the ultimate goal may be to eventually lead that person to a relationship with a traditional financial institution. So it's of every interest to banks and traditional financial institutions to be a part of the process and to be a part of supporting the work that is it's needed in our communities and it truly helps the low to moderate income communities that the banks are seeking to serve as well.